Hello people, my name is Mohini Day and you're watching my brand new talk show, What a Mellow Fog Wants. Firstly, I do want to say that I'm extremely grateful and blessed to have incredible people in my life around me, which has made me me today. This journey has been so terrific and absolutely overwhelming and it will never stop to be. I believe everything has been scripted by God and when we just allow this feeling to move through us, there is usually only a desire for more, which is never enough. Um, I feel like that's how it should be because if we feel we did the best, then there is no hunger. And if there is no hunger, then you will not do your best. I'm not saying don't feel you did good, but don't get carried away by that feeling, right? Um, today I have an extraordinary personality who has worked with numerous artists such as Wayne Shorter, Dennis Chambers, Alan Holdsworth, and so many more incredible artists. He's an American bassist and composer known foremost as the co-founder of the jazz fusion band Tribal Tech along with Scott Henderson and Kirk Covington. He's one of my biggest inspirations and my biggest idol. Please welcome the amazing Gary Willis. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is more arena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Applause. Yeah, like jazz club. More like. <laughs> okay, so firstly, how are you and how are you coping up with this situation? I know we already um, spoke about it, but this is for my listeners. They would really want to know. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm I'm doing fine, staying healthy. I'm um, I'm just being very, very careful, and right. I'm, I'm continuing to teach what is what, what I've been doing, and I'm Absolutely. enjoying that and the interaction with the uh, students, new students, and 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 old, and and just um, surviving until right. we get a little more freedom. Yeah. Right. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So now earlier, like I spoke, I believe that everything has been scripted by God. And when we just allow that feeling to move through us, there is only desire for more, which is never enough. Right. We're never satisfied. At least I am never satisfied of anything I do. That's why it pushes me to do better and better every day, work harder and harder every day. What's your approach to your musicianship? Um, it's it's changed over like i'm old <laughs> oh please you're it, not <laughs> it's changed over the decades i mean i remember when i was young just starting out and i had to go to a, a sister-in-law's wedding out of state or something and i in my I, I was panicking because i was going to be without my base for like three days <laughs> you know and later on um in my career it's like it became like a luxury just to be able to practice okay. you know and, and then later on they came up much more how i spent my time musically was was much more emphasis on creating the environment that i presented myself which is composition and bands and and concerts and and things that allowed me to say what i wanted to say um right. so um it, Kind of the, the thing throughout all of it is just um, maintaining like this sense of wanting to learn and be creative. Right, you know? right. And so, how did bass happen to you? Like, I, I'm always curious because is, is anybody in your family a yeah, musician? My, yeah, my family, um, they played in the church. Ah, and okay. Had a little group and they needed a bass player. So I got a bass. So nobody I, was a bass player though? No, no. I, I got a bass when I was 13. Did and, you want for it, or did you see somebody play and you got inspired, or how did you nope. pick up bass? My parents needed a bass player, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so I, I I I was playing in a church like four days later. You know, it was just um, something I adapted to. I got used to hearing music through my father's left hand. He played piano, okay. and he played this this bass and. Um, and bass lines and all he could do was swing he couldn't play straight eighth notes to save his life but i got used to hearing music through his left hand i just kind of gravitated towards it so right. um i got a guitar when i was 15 and i played and studied guitar for about seven years but the whole time i was always in bands playing bass mm, and okay. uh last year or so in college um i had to pay back a loan and so i sold my les paul kept my oh. precision and became a bass player <laughs> you know, full time, whatever, and so. Wow, uh, that's a great story. Yeah, it it never was, never was, never was in my mind to like make a career out of it. I just wanted to keep learning and keep playing with better players and right. be in situations where I can prove. And you never even thought about doing something else while you were playing. Um, 
I no. Um, it wasn't like I was playing that much, but I just I had an idea that I could keep at it, you know. Okay. And I've done, I've done all kinds of different things to support my music habit, you know. Right. Um, so, so, as a kid growing up, who were your major influences? Well, um, bass wise, um, I always say there's like, was it three or four? Um, um, Rocco Prestia. Oh. Our early on. Um, oh. Let's see. Um, Paul Jackson with the Headhunters. Yes. Definitely. Um, Anthony Jackson, super creative. Right. And then you can't play jazz and you can't play fusion without having, you know, listening to Jocko. So, Absolutely. <laughs> um, but after a while, it became like more, in, in, influences became more broader. And broader, so, right. Yeah. So I was inspired by, you know, like um, Bill right. Evans and and Herbie and Toots Steelmans and eventually film, you know, and with times changing, everything yeah. started evolving. Yeah. yeah. And so it became less centered on bass and more on just like what inspired me, what, you know, right. More yeah. towards story building and to express better and better every day. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's amazing. But you have such a unique sound when you're playing, you know, and you have a very cool technique as well that you play with all these. In when did you start working on these intricate det details of your techniques that you play with? With uh, Even when you're soloing or improvising, you always have a shape to when you're with your right hand. Mostly with bass players, it's the left hand which kind of changes its shape. But your right mm -hmm. hand it has a very unique shape that you play with. How did you discover that? I kind of got lucky in, in that I never had a bass teacher. <laughs> so Right. So nobody told you this is not right. This is not uh, wrong. No. So from day one, um, like I, I had a little Vox Panther bass. It was a short scale. And mm. it had one, a single pickup at an angle like this. And right. I was playing like one note per string type root fifth stuff. And... Uh -huh. The strings were ringing, so I put my thumb on the E string and then one, two, three on four strings, and it was quiet. Right. You know, <laughs> I could kind of trigger one string at a time. Right. And I played that way when I got a guitar when I was 15. Um, okay. And it, it worked out on its own for about seven years or something like that. Um, and I, one of my guitar teachers, like, saw me playing, and he said, okay, play a major scale. And I played, like, a two-octave major scale, yeah. you know competently and right. he said okay never mind he, he, he didn't want to <laughs> give me a pick he didn't want to didn't give me all that i remember right. when i was 13 my parents bought me a mel bay bass book and like on like the third page there's a picture of a guy holding a pick oh, for I, a bass <laughs> I'm, come on, like, this is not you know so i didn't go anywhere either so okay. so w once i reached that point where um i sold my les paul and was a bass player um right I had enough experience at the time studying the fingerboarding guitar that I felt safe uh, forgetting about the left hand and just concentrating on my right hand. Right hand. At right. that point, for about a month, I, I kind of like broke down everything that was going over here um, mm -hmm. subconsciously. It, it happened subconsciously before. So right. I, I kind of broke it down into exercises and responsibilities and kind of made a science out of it. Right. So, yeah. so that happened um maybe when i was 19 or 20 or something like that wow uh, or maybe yeah yeah around around there um so like when when i when i teach students um it's not necessary for them to adapt my technique yeah but i mean i don't know if you want to get down into these details about bass. No, of course why not please <laughs> sure <laughs> it's getting technical um um but the thing is like it uh Bass players and music um, happen over here with the left hand. It right. takes months, years to learn harmony and choose the notes and the shapes and geometry and, and names of notes and all that stuff. So this right. is a long, slow process. Right. It's possible in that process to forget about your left hand and let it just take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you'll get good over here and whatever your right hand has done... Yeah, it, it doesn't uh, support very well. Yeah. Uh oh it, it's a handicap because you yeah. have... Right. Because it requires so much attention over here. So right. 
what I encourage t- students to do, you don't have to adopt my technique, but you right. need to break down your right hand into a science. Totally. And make conscious all the decisions about which finger goes where, how you mute strings, how you shift. All those conscious things need to be right. assimilated and right. until they subconscious uh-huh. exactly like you want them to be. Right, so, absolutely. So do, when you're playing, uh, how's your approach like? Do you think in terms of harmonic sense or do you think in terms of time? Um, I'm hmm. sure both, but you know what I mean, like phrasing, the participation of the phrasings and uh, the polyrhythmic games that you can apply while soloing. Wow, I, I'm not aware of them. Really. <laughs> You know, like, like um, much- me from an Indian point of view, since Konakol is such a big thing in here, um, I don't know if you know, all the Takademi Takitas and stuff. I've heard, of, I've heard of them, but like... Yeah, yeah. So it's inter- like mathematics for us, yeah, you know? My inner and- clock goes up to like seven. Sorry? It, my inner clock goes up to about seven and it shuts down. <laughs> so, so, yeah. um, so... Over uh, an even pulse or over a triplet pulse or a three pulse, I can imagine all kinds of rhythms. Right, uh, right. And so like, the, when I'm communicating well, um, mm-hmm. the most important thing is my reaction to what I just played. Right, Or right. what everybody around me is playing. But say, for example, you're soloing. Do you, do you think in terms of harmonic sense first? Um, no. It's, it's like... Um, I can I can relate it mostly to a language. Like when you speak English, you don't think about grammar. Mm. Or you think about the topic and the subject and the verb or individual details like that. What's what's important is the idea. That you're yeah, I mean, to... there's a story behind everything that I want to say, and mm. I want it to. I want to express that as at least at my best as possible. Mm. So to whatever but, caliber I have. Um, so, so when but, I'm soloing. I think in terms of time, but also a little bit of harmonic sense, but mostly in terms of time, mostly in terms of even when I'm soloing, it has to be groovy and mm-hmm. at the same time melodic. Mm-hmm. So what, what works for me um, is when I'm, when I'm communicating well, um, uh-huh. like the, the harmony of a tune I've internalized. I know right. what's happening with harmony. I, I've also internalized uh, or externalize the harmony of the tune on the neck. So I know what the neck looks like totally. when the change. Yeah. Hmm. So back to what I was saying, reacting to my last idea, hmm. it will be, I will either hear the idea that I want to play next and see it unfold geometrically, or sometimes I will just see geometrically what should happen right. in relationship to what I just played. And as long as right. those two things are prioritized, then I'm communicating honestly and in the moment. If, right, I have, right. if I have to think about, okay, we're in the B section now, or this is the A section, or I should put a nine on this minor, or you know, whatever, any kind of detail like that, mm-hmm. then it, it, I lose the moment and I'm not reacting to what I just played. Right, 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 right. That's your way of approach. That's amazing. That's interesting. Because uh, a lot of people have, everybody's approaches are so different, but mm-hmm. we still end up meeting at the same point. That's, that's very cool. I really want to ask you this question since we are mm. talking about this. How much of your playing in your gigs, especially, especially solos, is completely improvised over, say, chops or patterns that you've already worked out before? And if it's both, then how do you keep the balance? Um, it, I'm going to have to resort to a language again. Okay. Is it, is it when, like subconscious when, muscle memory that you, you know, sometimes, like in my case, when I'm soloing or say improvising, I would resist from doing something that I would always do, you know, like I don't want to do that because I always do that, you know, I want to do something else, right? Even mm-hmm. though I want to feel that at that very moment, I try and kind of challenge myself to not do that, like, right? So what, what do you do? Well, um, Let's see, I learned to improvise before I knew the names of the notes or any kind of information. Same, same, same. So, so that instinct um, has been part of my learning process the whole time. So, mm-hmm. um, like, um, like, there was a period, like, a, a recent uh, series of concerts that I did with Gergo and uh, a sax player here, Hubert Fortune, um, where we would play every week and we would play a set of completely improvised music. 
Mm. So in situations like that, you you can't enforce you can't force your preconditioned chops or something. Right, absolutely, absolutely. It's not mm. going to fit the music. So it's not going to fit. Yeah. In that sense, you're you're having a conversation, and you're bringing up topics, and you're reacting to topics, and you're weaving your way through these compositions live. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that, but that, you know, there are situations when like you cannot do that, uh, but especially when you're a part of like a big pop band and oh, then yeah. they ask you to do oh. like, okay, you have to do exactly the same, no matter what you're feeling at that moment, you can't do that. Just do what's needed. <laughs> you know, that, that was the setting for, for that event. You know, it's like, we're just yeah. going to, not going to play tunes. Yeah. And then, um, like the, the last, and then, and then several, several maybe 30 40 50 percent of my solo cds are jamming moments like that and then right. the last the last three travel tech cds we did were based on just pressing record in the studio <laughs> wow that's amazing has it ever happened now since you're one of the co-founders of tribal tech band has it ever happened when jamming or say making songs um is it just like you go for the jam or do you guys discuss like say i have an idea and you have an idea let you show it to each other and then you start jamming or you just go for it um both uh a lot of it is like just pressing record and ah. Don't turn it off until something good happens. Something's good happening, yeah. And, and sometimes it's it's utter crap, you know. <laughs> uh, one of the, yeah. some of the some of the most mu humiliating times we've had as a band is that there was one tour we did where we were going to try to jam every night, okay. and um, if you don't have a really good monitor set up where you can hear everybody and have good eye contact, then you can't jam, and it's going to oh. suck. And <laughs> there's no there's no more hellish place on earth than being in front of people and and not understanding it, what they're actually saying it's it's a horrible yeah it's like a horrible feeling so we kind of bailed on that because we didn't have the infrastructure of monitor people and and mixing and all that stuff so and and even like the first time we tried it um in the studio uh for the record thick um the record company was calling us like, like hey how are the compositions company you know you got your tunes ready and all that stuff and we just lied yeah. and yeah, we're ready to go. And, <laughs> and the first time we got in the studio, we didn't really set up to take advantage of eye contact and communication and things like that. Guitar was in a separate room. I was in the room with keyboards. Drums were over here. We couldn't really talk. And it was okay. a failure. We, we didn't get anything done. And okay. we had to like, go on our hands and knees to the record company and say, hey, can we get some more time because there were technical issues, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> So oh, the God. next time we went in, uh, me and Henderson and Kinsey were all in the same room, and I had a right. microphone. They had a microphone. They could talk to Kirk, and and jams just happened organically. And then right. other times we would say, you know, we get to the end of the tune, said like this needs an ending, and somebody goes, hey, check this out, and then we would just play up and punch in, and we wrote the ending. Okay. Right, right. Has it ever happened like you like something and say the other person didn't like it and the other person liked it how who takes that final uh, uh final judgment that okay no let's keep this this sounds better okay uh is that like a collective mutual judgment or yeah, pretty, is that an individual like sometimes we'll we'll listen like in a in a jam composition setting mm -hmm. we'll listen to everything we did mm -hmm. and we'll each take notes and suggest moments and say this could be a tune or that is definitely a tune or whatever and we'll <laughs> we'll all reach an agreement on what the potential of the music is. And then right. what we ended up doing is we, the three of us, um, not Kirk, but the three of us, keyboards, guitar, and bass, mm -hmm. each of us would take responsibility for three tunes. Right. And in and, and taking responsibility, that means like choosing, okay, is there a melody? Does it need a melody? Does it need a bridge? Does it need right. bridge? You know what I mean? Some, tunes, some tunes were done. Right. You know, for this really cool jam that yeah, those that, assignments are needed. Otherwise, it just gets too messy. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so everybody took responsibility for three tunes. Um, right. Sometimes I remember, like, there was one time where I didn't feel like playing this on this rock thing, mm -hmm. and and Henderson and Kirk played this amazing trio jam, and right. um, I I was just not in the mood, and what I played was crap. So, um, a month later, when we were at home doing our own uh, own overdubs, I like I was able to 
overdub a really fun bass part to it, you know, that I wasn't in the mood for. That complemented that yeah. part. Hmm. So, so sometimes the, the flow is not there, but you can find it later. You know? Right, right. Very composing, cool. Composing based on inspired moments. You know? Right, well said. Amazing. So now since we only got to play, we only got to kind of play together through your app, uh, yeah. Groove A Day, I have always been very curious and my listeners also have been messaging me. How did you come up with this plan and when did this app idea all start? Well, um, it, it kind of, um, it, it, it like, whatever, first thing I do is like recommend, like, don't take on a project that's a single everything every day for a year. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's the first question. Don't do what I did. Um, no, what I, what I, what I found that I found it difficult to teach students, um, mm -hmm. is how to develop a baseline over time how to add elements to it, how to have it grow, how to have it complement and make a kind of a particular drum groove. Right. Not every so, groove, bass groove will go with every drum groove, no. Oh, it, it's not so much that, it's just how do you adapt your that groove over time so that two minutes later it's burning, you know, mm. and supporting right. a solo. Because so you can build more. Yeah. I, was, I was never, ever satisfied listening to music or playing music where the bass part never changed. Mm. I hear drummers and soloists getting into all this exciting, like, you know, developing stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, wanted, I wanted bass players, to under, I wanted myself to do, be participating in that, take responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find an environment that challenged students to do that because you can put on a groove. Mm -hmm. You could say, okay, play this groove with the drums, but then, okay, add to it, and why? Why should I add to it? It's not changing, you know? There's not a <laughs> or anything. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so un unless you've got, um, in this amazing, for me, it's an amazing environment to have Gurgo sitting there, like, pounding out the basic groove, and then gradually adding to intensity and levels. Like It's like gears. Yeah. And Listening to you, yeah. Yeah, you know, so it's like gears in a car where you just keep adding to the intensity until finally it's at the end and it's burning. And so the bass right. can cannot just sit there and play the same thing the whole time. Sure. You need to have a vocabulary for for doing that. So, yeah. so um, started thinking about um, a concept for it and a groove a day seemed like you know something that people remember. Yeah, it's a good day. I mean, the day I'm saying it's a good. Uh, a uh, name also that mm -hmm. you can groove a day. Don't yeah. overdo it. Just study this one, one. groove. Play yeah. it. Play it. Play it. Feel it. Feel it. Feel it. Yeah. You know. So um, so uh, I think I think the most that we ever did in one day was like forty. <laughs> we built the studio. So you didn't play a groove a day. No, we <laughs> did like twenty. <laughs> 40 every every time we got together oh so my God. Yeah, yeah so um i'm sure you've seen this but gergo plays the hell out of finger drums on a piano yes 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 he, i have and he plays amazing bass too oh yeah yeah he can kill that too yeah. <laughs> At anything really oh god so he would come over the day before and i would sit there with the bass and he's with his finger drums and we would just think of grooves you know and okay this is number 320 okay and then next okay uh what about this you know and so we would play each other examples and record the examples so that we'd have a reference the next day when we're in the right, right. in our studio and so um yeah it was about like 10 or 12 sessions you know 30 or 40 or 20 something like that a day so uh, after you recorded all these things then you had the idea of bringing in some guest artists or did um, you have that plan that, already before no, even doing it. That was it. an idea later when I started thinking about how how people could fit into it, you know, because right. the, the in in releasing a, a groove a day, the the in on social media, it's like it, there's enough of me like in every event, you know. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, other artists like yourself, you know, contribute to it and, and seeing what they could do over it that like just I think it clicks in people's mind that hey, I could I could do something over this myself, you know. Right, right. Just that, um, just that uh, portrait of how to expand ideas. Mm -hmm. It yeah. kind of is a good way to show people how you can do it. Yeah, 
Yeah, beautiful. So, That's so initially it was just like I mean, it, it is still. I use it for all my students. It's a, mm. it's an environment where a, a bass player, first of all, like repeating that first element, um, is important about uh, sensation of grooving. You right. Like, once you change one thing, people are like, "What?" You know, <laughs> everybody in the band is on alert. Like, wait, what happened to the groove? You know. <laughs> Yeah. But at the same time, to me, it's improvisational because right. in the spaces between the, the 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 skeleton main groove, in the spaces, there's room for um, ideas. Right. And if you pay close attention of your and and treat your ideas as something to be developed, then you could play a two note fill this bar, and then the next bar you can play a two note fill, maybe different notes. You right. know. So because people hear that repeat in the same place, right. it, it reinforces that it's grooving, right. but you're creating in the moment. You know? right. and next time you play it, it may be something else different there. But totally. the, fact that you're, the fact that you're repeating it or reacting to what you just played, people can hear that sense of repetition and it's grooving. Totally. Know? But totally. it's improvisational too at the same time. Right. Very cool. Um, what is your ultimate direction when you're writing songs? Say you have an idea and you are expanding on that. What is the direction that you uh, typically uh, tend to, you know, fall towards? Um, I, th I think in my process, um, like I'm an, I, you know, I'm an idea collector. Right, because I've heard all your songs. I mean, I've heard every song of yours, and I've grown up listening to every song of yours and learning every solo. Oh my oh. God, hours and hours and hours, you know. <laughs> and every every solo I hear, every song idea I hear, it's just so informative and at the same time very different from one another, you know. That that's kind of a challenge. Um, you you have to. Um, like the the composing process for me is uh, I'll collect ideas and if I don't hate them um, then they they don't get deleted you know and I'll I'll keep returning to an idea until I can find ways to continue it and then once an idea starts to, starts to take shape then um, it defines itself you know right. it, it it the environment of the groove that I chose or the environment of the bass line or the environment of the harmony. Mm -hmm. will set the stage for everything that should happen, whether it should be a right. melodic slow melody or a fast melody or a bass melody or mm -hmm. a sp sparse with no harmony. Like it, it right. all de help defines itself. And so y you have to have a, an openness to, to follow the tune where it wants to go. Right. And at the same time, you have to have an awareness of what you've done before so that you don't go off that same Track. Right, and completely, uh, like, just forget the first part and do completely something else. <laughs> yeah, or, or just put things that you've already done there, you know. Right, so, maybe just a hint of it would still work. Uh, yeah. So it, it was, um, I've written hard shit for myself to play. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I mean. Yeah. Uh, hard chord changes, you know, um, I don't know why, but it, it, I, I remember uh, like three CDs ago when I did actual fiction, this more electronic record. I remember um, thinking, man, I'm going to have to call a horn player or somebody to do a solo on this because when I tried, when the first time I tried to play over some of these things, uh, it was just my same old shit, you know? And it just, it, and so I had to like, like lock myself in a room and, and really stretch to come out, come up with new ideas, different yeah. ways. Of playing over mm -hmm. these things that didn't right. sound like what I'd done before, so, so that's that's the growing part where you can challenge yourself to to get things out of your you know by by creating a specific environment mm -hmm. musically and compositionally that requires certain types of things. Right, right. Grow musician. If you if you just only write ice cream changes for yourself and and easy tempos and. Yeah. And you know, then you're you're not necessarily going to grow as a musician, you know. Totally. So, totally. So, yeah. following the tune wherever it wants to go, and then providing whatever the tune demands in your playing is 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 how it takes care you of. You like challenges. I guess so. Are you like <laughs> challenging yourself? 
I like suffering. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> cool. What has been your biggest challenge so far throughout your journey? What has been that oh. one biggest challenge? Um, I don't. I don't know. I think. I think the the thing that we were just touching on. Um, yeah, that's why I asked you because you were just gonna say and. Yeah, it's sort of like like, how do you define yourself? You know, um, as a bass player, up to a certain point uh, in my career, I define myself by by sort of getting an identity with my sound uh, and how I played. Mm. Um, but until I started writing music for myself, I I wasn't I knew I wasn't going to grow anymore because I I discovered um, through playing with some great people, the mm. amazing that um you you're probably more than likely not going to find the ideal sideman situation that will let you express exactly what you want to say every I but it's like kind of a do it yourself world up there you have to you know you have to write the music you have to book the rehearsals call the musicians get the gigs get the photos like every every element Everything. You know? so so Getting get a, getting a handle on on all of those elements, I think, was the is is the biggest challenge, you know. And right. at the same time, at the same time, maintaining like a sense of direction, mm, you know, sense of direction, yes. You know that that all these things are tied together and influence each other. And right, you know. what inspires you the most now? Now that we are all we have all this time to ourselves, and n normally when we are traveling and touring. How was it then, and how is it now? Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I or should I say, in, in, instead of inspiring, how do you? Yeah, I mean, in a way, inspiring also. Like, what inspires you to hold your base and practice something during touring, and what inspires you now to hold your base and practice? You know, that was ne it was never possible touring. <laughs> <laughs> uh. it's never possible touring, and then. And like I said, in recent. So you're not the kind of person who likes to like warm up until like half an hour before the show. Jesus, no! I never no. warm up. No. Mm. no. I used to a lot. Like I would spend like the whole day on the show day, and then I would realize after a while, once I started growing up, I'm like, no, I'm actually losing stamina by yeah. doing that. I don't need to do that. It's okay. Let me give it a shot. I was scared to do that, yeah. but then when I just gathered my guts and I said to myself that no you have to do it it's okay you've practiced enough it's okay you yeah. can do it and then I realized I had so much stamina I could play for like four or five hours yeah. not losing stamina at all <laughs> yeah the, the thing is is like my my technique um uh was I I built it uh based on bringing gear to the gig <laughs> so if you bring enough in you know, enough air moving equipment to the gig then my technique didn't suffer i could play soft right, right. So it, my whole technique is about relaxing and letting the amp like kick ass kick ass yeah so because of that relaxing, so you're really soft touch here completely it's soft touch here. yeah me too i'm not hitting hard although people think i hit hard but i don't actually it's it's the volume it's the hands yeah. are really soft yeah yeah, so so because that's built into my technique, there's nothing to warm up. You know, there's not any conflicting muscles to get loose or blood right, flow. Right. To get so right. we always used to start with uh, this tune called the Big Wave. Right, I love that tune. That was life changing for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would start the night with that, just like Oof. bam, you know, like no bam. warm up, nothing, you know, just. I no. was there for the show when you guys played at the St. Andrew's Auditorium in Mumbai. Yeah, yeah, wow. I came uh, with my dad. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. So, um, so no, um, so, so, man, like, just what inspires me is just uh, whatever will occupy the most brain cells, and that means sometimes learning a, a new skill or software or hobby or thing that I'm into, and mm -hmm. if it if it demands my full attention, then that's inspiring. You know, yeah, so um, sometimes that's music, sometimes that's software, sometimes it's video, sometimes it's cameras, sometimes it's bikes. You know, mm -hmm. it's just whatever I do, I go off the deep end into it, you know. Right, 
focus is always there. Yeah. So, so here, one one thing I've come to terms with um, that that people might not agree with or that might find it interesting is that in in life in general, um, there's no such thing as a balance. Balance. Yeah. I, I don't think there is. It's like, like in, you, in terms of what? If you're talented and you're and you're able to do multiple things well, you know, okay. then then some things are going to require, require your attention, and you're going to have to be at, focused on this, even yeah. though this other thing you could be doing or you'd want to be doing, but taken care of. And it's like there's no balance. You have I, to. Yeah, think. totally. I feel like you wouldn't give it your all if you have an option B or C. Yeah. So, so the so the the if you if you stop worrying about a balance and just give yourself over to focusing on what you're doing. On one thing, yeah. And then and then when the next thing comes along, do that, and then do the that. next thing. And full dedication, yeah. And then then you're not then you're not so torn when you're on this one thing. You're true. not torn. So true. Like, and people yeah. have a hard time understanding that they just hop in and out of different things. Like, oh my God, yeah. how can you do that? It just stresses me out. So like, much. Yes. like there, there is no balance to achieve. It's it's sort of like you just go down this path and then you switch over to this one and you switch over to this one, and it, and you just kind of let the let mind do its thing. Yeah. Focus like yeah. go full on. You know. Right. Right. Beautiful. That's a beautiful answer. We're towards the end of the questions. Um. Mm -mm, let's see. Okay. So everybody on all of your YouTube videos. Uh, there's one thing which has been very consistent, which is um, was speed, the speed that, that you play with. I'm sure you relate to this. I feel like most of your students would have asked you this at one point. How did you get your speed and how did you work on that? Was it a subconscious decision or you never thought of it, never thought about it? Or did you actually work towards it? <laughs> well, um, I think um, if if you go down the direction I did with tech re being really kind of scientific about your technique mm. and, and teach yourself to, that it's not, uh, about strength and forcing it, um, right. and learning to be like super More about definition. Yeah. Super efficient with your, with your right hand, super efficient right. with your left hand. Um, and, and maintaining like a relaxation. I mean, a, there was a student who asked me, like, um, if I'd studied Zen, you know, <laughs> I, I took it as a compliment, but no, I haven't, you know, um, but, but there is this contradiction and this, this relates to your question about speed. And there's a contradiction about, um, you're on stage, the band is kicking ass, kicking ass, the house is rocking and you're throwing down and all of the physical human instincts are to like seize the moment, play hard, dig in. And me, I'm just doing this. Yeah. You know, just this little thing here while everything else is going, you know? Right. So that, that conflict, that contradiction between burning physicality, killing, you know, intensity and calm, you know, center of the hurricane or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. helps with this concept of speed, you know, right. there, you kind of have and also to, I feel like, um, uh, your intonation matters, obviously. And at the same time, I feel like playing soft is another trick to playing fast, not well, digging it too much. Yeah. It's, it's, um, sort of like not, it's, it's not something to, to be forced. Um, right. or it's like you can, if your if your amp is cooperating, if you, <laughs> if you hit an environment, yeah. when, like I did this for two years, I, for two years, I realized that, uh, playing harder with my right and playing softer with my right hand and turn the amp up, got a really fat tone. <laughs> I, I had this shitty little 60 watt amp in 15 that I took on gigs and playing with Kirk and people like that, there was no way I could keep up. And I had calluses, I had pain in my hand and it took two years of, first of all, trading gear, improving equipment until finally I had like a 800 watt power amp and two 15 inch speakers. And in those two years, every situation I could, I made my environment louder than it should be. Practice right. 
with headphones, amp amp in 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 rooms. You know, every every place mm. I was too loud to get myself to relax and turn it down because that's the tone I wanted. Right. So if you can if you can condition yourself for those reactions so that so that when it's, when it's time to play fast, it's not like a a tension thing. It just flows out of you. You just yeah. gave me a cool idea, by the way. Like, what if on stage during live performances, you know how drummers use that uh, transparent thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. What if we have that for like amplifiers and speakers? You know, room it. Just room it, it and put a mic. It's it's possible. Um, I don't know how it'll sound, but maybe. Yeah, I, no, the only the only thing the is shot. the only thing is about bass frequencies tend to reflect once the wall is like 20 feet yeah so then that then that will be like a whole room for that yeah. <laughs> you get the whole room. so it, it may not capture uh um the bass frequencies it like probably the, has to be backstage then yeah yeah so no but like on on big stages or something like that um or or even recording in the studio i will make sure um that that something is hitting my torso like right. in the stu in the studio, it, headphones never let you hear enough bass. Yeah, yeah. Just a feeling of bass in the torso. Right. So I will put an amp amp behind my torso and just barely turn it up, and then when I play, I I feel it. Same thing on stage. I'm always standing Me too. within. Me too. Within I'm always standing amp, close to them. Yeah. Putting it through monitors and hearing it come at me from all these other directions. No, I can't. I can't live with that. You know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's in the torso. But what about uh, when you're in a when you're a part of a big band and uh, you want to hear the other players? That time you use an in ear for the other musicians for um, you to be able to hear them, or do you use a monitor like a wedge? Never had that luxury. I've never had that luxury. Um, uh, it's always been monitors on stage, and and I'm I haven't played that many big bands. Okay. You know, mostly quartets, mm. quintets, maybe. You know. So, right. like, so in those and, kind of situations, you just ask for a wedge. Yeah, and 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 even then, uh, a lot of times the the very first thing I put in a wedge is the drummer's hi hat. Drummer's hi hat. Me too. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the heartbeat. That's the thing you can right. trust. I, I put the kick and the hi hat. Yeah, like, but for me, like the kind of music I normally play, kicks don't delineate where one is all the time. You know. <laughs> Kicks and snares are like hit or miss. You can't rely on those. But that that hi hat, mm -hmm. that's that's the heartbeat. You know, it's gonna be in like, India. You cannot like depend on the drummers because they will never show you the one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like I, I I learned the hard way one time because I had to set up. I'd been playing uh, with in some jazz situations. I set up on for some reason I don't know why I set up on the right side of the drums where the crash was and, oh. and the was, and I was getting lost all night. That's nope. bad. That's yeah. that's that's painful. It's embarrassing. Yeah. So I I vowed every time after that to like set up on the the left side of the drums and hear right. that I had you know. Right. Right. Wow. That was amazing. That was a good conversation. I'm so happy yeah. you could yeah. do this, and I'm yeah. so happy to have you on board on my show. No, it's it's been pleasure. Awesome. So now we're gonna play a rapid fire round with five questions, and it's gonna have to be quick. Okay. okay. Um, but you have to tell me because I I said uh, what what's the name of the show? What a mellow. What a mellophile wants. What's a mellophile? Mellophile means anybody who just loves music. It doesn't have to be he or she so, doesn't have to be a musician, or okay. it it could be a lawyer, it could be an engineer, it could be I don't know a doctor. Okay. Anybody who loves music is called mellophile. So it has it comes from melody then. Yeah, I think so. I think okay. so. Yeah. Cool. Pretty name. It has a ring to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to make this show not just for musicians, but no, for no, anybody, no, yeah. you know? Engineers, sound engineers, techies, yeah. they all love music, right? Yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to name it something which relates to everybody. Cool, cool. Yeah. Okay, my first question to you is, if you could switch to any other instrument, what would it be? Um... Wow, I'm torn between <laughs> drums and piano. Really? Yeah. Um, probably piano. Okay. Because uh, I'm not good. I couldn't sit down and play you a song. I, you know? I have 
I've never played piano in my life. I tried once and I sucked. I, I promised myself I would never try it again. <laughs> so the thing is, I can find things on piano. Yeah. In in a really slow amount of time, I can find right. things. I, I can't sit there and perform, you know. And so, in a way, I would have much quicker access to my ideas if I wanted to compose or something like that. But at the same right. time, the fact that they're harder to arrive at right. probably makes them more special when I do find them. <laughs> you know? And it, right. the same thing with the same things with like acceptance and. But it's also it's also kind of it it must be kind of frustrating because you're so good at the bass and when you sit down on piano you're trying to expand it and like play you're like oh shit i can do so much better uh, on my bass <laughs> no but but like the you know i've kind of seen it happen where or like people are good at something right away yeah. and and the because it maybe it doesn't feel earned or the, you know it's like over time their focus goes somewhere else you know <laughs> you know yeah. so i'm None of this has come like. I think I always had a good ear, put it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I was not a, always a good bass player, you know. I mean, I did an audition once where I had to play a tune for um, somebody, and at the end they said, "Do you own a metronome?" <laughs> really? I can't <laughs> believe that. Yeah, yeah. I I was that bad. Yeah. Oh my God! Well, yes. you must have been really young, though. I was no, I just wasn't really good. I went and bought a metronome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's funny. Okay, what annoys you the most? Um. Okay, can you narrow it down to music or? No, it could be anything. It could be something that happens every day, or I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so okay, put it. This is something I think. Like I'm, for me, it's negativity that annoys me the most. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm gonna be more specific. Okay, <laughs> we're, we're in a lockdown quarantine. Um, every all of us are watching more TV. Mm. I hate it when people try to tell stories and there's always background music. <laughs> it it never stops. Like yeah. You know, so insulting to your intelligence is that, oh, I'm supposed to feel this now because, because of the music and not because of how well it's written or how well it's right, right. Some of the right. best, some of the best writing, you know, like um, Better Call Saul, for example. You is know, that a movie? It's a series. It's it's okay. uh it's based on the lawyer from Breaking Bad. Okay. <laughs> Um, and probably baking bread as well. It's like it's it, 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 they don't really. It, it's not a crutch that they they don't rely on music to make you feel something. It's like mm. just writing. And because and a lot of times you, the sound design you can hear this overall like um, background noise of a of a air conditioning or something. <laughs> you actually feel like you're there with them instead of oh, having shit. instead of having these strings swell and this stupid you know. Right, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, it's to be annoying when when the stories could be like have more impact with that. You know. Right. True. Describe yourself in four words. <laughs> four words. Yeah. Um. Okay. Intense. Relaxed. Hmm. Maybe two is enough. <laughs> okay. Relaxed. <laughs> um. Okay, one more. Mm. Friendly. Friendly. <laughs> Even though my looks contradict it, you know. <laughs> my doesn't give off you <laughs> funny know, yeah i know yeah um curious curious hmm interesting nice okay what is the worst compliment you've received so far um worst compliment i think that metronome thing right what you <laughs> said that wasn't a compliment that was just a like an honest evaluation oh uh, god 
Oh wow! I I don't know. I I don't tend those. Like you know, sometimes you're playing and you worked your like you played the best night, and then with me, what happened is like I played a show, and then this guy comes up to me. This was one of my best nights, yeah. Mm. And then this guy comes up to me. And he's like, "I like your dress," and I'm like, in my head, after all that heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'll I'll put it this way. I've like. Like one of the biggest insults, and it's not really a compliment. Yeah, it's okay. This is a compliment, but an insult. Okay. It's like there were so much of Tribal Tech. Was, I mean, almost all of it was the four of us loading gear. You know, we were a moving company 22 hours out of the day, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then we get the, the fun part was we get to play, you know, for a couple hours. Yeah. And then afterwards, um, there would be fans, people that want to hang out and, and, you know, be your fan during that time. Mm -hmm. And they would hang out and they would see us lifting all this stuff and moving all this stuff. They never lifted a finger. Mm -hmm. so it was like, it was a compliment to be, they wanted to be around, but they didn't have the presence of mind to like, here, let me get that for you or for something. You. Yeah. That, well, if I would have met you that day and I knew that, then I would have definitely given you a hand. Thanks, thanks. So much. It was, it was kind of a contradiction. But I was yeah. not allowed, so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was too young, actually. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, what, what, what is it like growing up in a base household? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Uh, it has its two sides. It has its sides. Yes. Uh, first. Um, having mother as a singer and dad as a bass player, music was always floating in the house. And mm -hmm. I had a lot of information on my head because both were really, really um, renowned and informative. So mm -hmm. I already had the knowledge that I needed from mm -hmm. home. And then, of course, dad used to get me like these uh, music school books, books and stuff. So I can yeah. learn to read and write because right. in India we don't have. Now we do. Few, mm -hmm. few. We have a few music schools, but back then we didn't have any music schools in here, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. my dad really wanted me to be international and he wanted me to learn to read and write. Mm -hmm. um, and he already saw it, like he had it all planned for me. He thought, oh, this girl can feel the tempo, she has the groove, because what he used right. to do is he would put headphones on my ears while he was while he would practice through mm -hmm. his uh, processor we were not financially very strong so all we had was this little processor that he had and he would mm -hmm. put headphones and he would put the headphones on my ears at the age of three i started tapping the right tempo Kept and up. he yeah. saw that and wow. he saw and he thought oh there is no female bass player at that time there were none you yeah, know yeah. and yeah. especially in india no way um yeah. i mean in india that time uh, for a girl to be a doctor or a lawyer or do something, go, even going out of the house, it was, oh my God, a big deal, you know? Mm -hmm. So my dad already had decided that I'm going to make my daughter stronger than a man and she's going to yeah. kick her ass. She's going to cool. kick everybody's ass, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. So he started teaching me at the age of three wow. on that big bass that he had. It was a Fender Jazz four string. And wow. the first exercise that he gave me was daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy on different strings. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still remember that. And um, it's so I can still picture it. It's so oh. crystal clear, you know, Easy. like I have that understanding. It's strange, but I could I can imagine everything. Um, so I think around the age of six ish, I started taking lessons properly from my dad, like scales, mm -hmm. notes and stuff. Right. And yeah. he thought he started to teach me uh, songs like uh, Got a Match or mm -hmm. like Big Wave. Uh, oh. Yeah, all these complicated songs. <laughs> and I have like videos of me trying to learn those licks and chops part by part. And we have it on our CDs, you know. So he was a dreamer, you know, he was a dreamer. Yeah. He wanted me, he wanted his girl to be something. And he knew there was fire inside me and he yeah. gave his heart out be behind me. And he, every time he would come back, even at late nights after he would come back from shows, he would wake me up and be like, okay, this is your lesson for today. Tomorrow I'm going to check. Okay. So wow. I have, yeah. So apart from spending like what, eight hours in school, 
yeah. after I would come back home, I would have to finish my school homework, finish my private classes homework, and then do my music practice, you know, wow. find time to eat. There was no playtime. Yeah. Hell no. Yeah. Playtime was my base. Did you enjoy yeah. it? At first, no. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes, at first, no. But then slowly, slowly, I started enjoying it. Um, I think I started enjoying the spotlight. And that's when I started enjoying playing and mm -hmm. delivering my best because I could understand that there is something inside me that people like and I can play. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I practice harder and harder, I will be stronger and stronger day by day and people will like me even more. It mm -hmm. started out like that. And then it came to a point, there were different kinds of phases, right? I mean, I'm a kid growing up. I was starting to have sense from so nonsense. Like so when you rebelled, you were like every teenager go through rebellion. What when did you yeah. like did you like rock music for rebellion or what was your <laughs> So I actually wanted to hang out with my friends and I would fight with my parents, be yeah. like, you know, I wanna go hang out with my friends, I wanna go to movies with them, you know, why don't you allow and blah blah blah. And <laughs> they'd be like, No, don't waste your time. You can have all this time when you grow up and you're you know, you're playing your ass off after you're successful and everything, you'll have all this time. But now it's this is your foundation time. Yeah, so yeah. He, yeah, so he gave me the right education and there was always the right upbringing in the house, but I was rebellious, right? Um, but I had my own personality with mm -hmm. time passing by and uh, growing around a lot of elders. They were, I was, what, 15, 16 and 16 and I was already playing with a lot of musicians and gigging and playing yeah. in clubs and playing in wow. festivals and stuff, you know? So growing up around a lot of elders who were about 45, 50, mm -hmm. gave me a different perspective, gave me a different outlook towards looking at things, you know? And probably made me more mature than my age. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm 23 now, but when I work with these people, they always tell me that, you know, you're not like any other 23 year old because you yeah. have grown up playing with much older people and you have the maturity of a 50 year old, you know, Very and um, and that sometimes is a problem in my personal life. Yes, because mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's not easy to find friends, right? Of right. course, you can have friends in the music industry who you play with and everything, but okay. they are work friends. Yeah. Um, I've always had this, as a kid growing up, I've always had this feeling of having my own age group friends, right. probably playing badminton, probably playing, I don't know, cricket or football, okay. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Just that hang time, you know, right. that right. was never there. So that childhood was, life was never there. But now, when I look back, I am so glad that my parents brought me up, brought me up that way because I wouldn't have been me if they didn't do that. Totally, totally. Yeah, and now I have all this time to chill because mm -hmm. I did what I did back then. You took, took care of business, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it makes so much sense. Like if I w if I have kids one day, I would train them just the mm -hmm. way my parents brought me up, you know? Probably not so hard, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like uh, at first I always wanted another thing. I wanted to become a fashion designer, actually. After oh. I uh, finished my 12th board exams, mm -hmm. I wanted to become a fashion designer. I applied for a fashion college and my dad was never really supportive of that because he was like, what are you going to do there? There are so many fashion designers out there, but there's no female bass player out there. You got to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he meant it in a like, you know, emotional oh, yeah. way. And yeah. I was so mad at him at that time because I really yeah. wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And then around that time, I got a job offered by uh, A.R. Rahman's band. So A.R. Mm -hmm. Rahman here is, I don't know if you know him, he's like a right? yeah. couple of Grammy Awards winner and he's like really big in here. He's the biggest artist in here, a composer, mm -hmm. producer. He's won Oscar awards, BAFTA awards, wow. a lot of awards. and. Um, Cool. So, so I got an opportunity to be a part of his band that time, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like a call from the God, like, don't yeah. go there, just do this, yeah. you know, just focus. You've spent many years working hard, a little more harder, harder and harder every day. Don't give up for this, which you actually don't know anything about, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, 
And then on the other hand, I had the sense of uh, understanding the importance of what it was that moment. Uh, mm -hmm. And I become yeah. a part of his band until now. I'm still playing with him. It's been what eight and a half years. I've been working in his band, and yeah, um, yeah it's been an overwhelming journey. Like I said in the first, you know, it's been a terrific journey. And I just keep playing. I just keep playing and studying. And uh, still play big waves, still play your <laughs> solos, you know. <laughs> I love it. It just makes me happy, you know. Yeah, yeah that was my journey. <laughs> awesome. Well, tell, tell your dad hello for me. I don't think I've met him. So. He will be so happy. He's a big fan of yours. Cool, cool. Thank you so much, Gary. Tell it him was that. lovely having you. Thanks for your pointing you in this direction. You know? Aw, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy you could do this. Yeah. Wow.